Hi, this is David Harper of Bionic Turtle with a quick review of the internal ratings-based risk weight function under Basel II. This is especially for FRM candidate customers. And to keep this in perspective, recall that Basel II has three pillars, and it's the first pillar that contains the rules, the quantitative rules for determining the minimum capital requirements. Within that first pillar, there are rules for determining the capital charge for each of credit risk, market risk, and operational risk. This graphic or visual summary only refers to the credit risk rules under the first pillar. And yesterday, I reviewed the most basic approach within the rules for credit risk. And that basic approach was called standard or standardized. And you'll recall it's more basic because it just uses a lookup table based on the type of the exposure and the rating, we look up a risk weight and we produce a risk weighted asset or risk weighted exposure. So that was the basic approach under credit risk. Then the theory is that larger banks or smaller banks that evolve and start to develop more advanced internal systems for measuring and managing risk can migrate into the set of advanced approaches to calculating credit risk. And broadly, these are the internal ratings-based approaches, as in the bank gets to use internally developed inputs. And there are two major variations, foundation and advanced. I won't go into those now because just what I'd like to review is the internal ratings-based risk weight function. And the basic idea in going from standardized to IRB that is from going from basic to advanced, is that we move from a lookup table to a formula or a function. And the formula or function, which I'll show you next, is a formula or function of four risk components. The probability of default, the exposure at default, the loss given default, and the maturity of the exposure. And for FRM candidates who studied Michael Ong under internal credit risk model, these are analogous to expected default frequency, adjusted exposure. He also has loss given default as well, which we know is one minus the recovery rate. And so the main difference between foundation and advanced is that under foundation, the bank gets to develop its own internal estimate of the probability of default but the supervisor provides the other three. And then if the bank can migrate, can justify and earn into an even more advanced approach, the advanced IRB, meeting several additional rigorous quantitative and qualitative criteria, then the bank can use its own internal estimates for all four components. So, but that's the basic idea. We go from a lookup table to a, form, a formula or function. Now I'd like to show you the function. So here's the formula for the IRB risk weight function, and it looks intimidating at first, but it's not so bad if we break it down into pieces. To illustrate what it's doing, I've copied here a hypothetical credit risk distribution. Notice it has positive skew, where the green line is the expected loss on the credit asset, and the red line is a credit value at risk. And so the capital charge, that's the K here, is a charge for the unexpected loss, which is the difference between these two lines. That is to say, the unexpected loss is the credit value at risk, given some confidence, minus the expected loss. As a VAR idea, you'll recall, this line can be anywhere based on our confidence. The higher the confidence, the more we push this line to the right on the tail. And in the IRB risk weight function, the confidence is hardwired at 99.9% confidence. So what we have here is a capital charge for the unexpected loss, which is the credit VAR at 99.9% .9 confidence minus the expected loss. And you'll notice right here in the formula is the subtraction for the expected loss. It's LGD times probability of default. Now, this part right here is the credit VAR at 99.9% confidence. It's also called the conditional expected loss. And that's because the formula is translating the expected loss into something worse, a conditional expected loss, largely as a function here of rho, the correlation coefficient. So this is what it means 
when the documentation refers to an asymptotic single risk factor model. There's a single risk factor here being used for the credit asset. To understand this, let's imagine this were zero for a second. In other words, let's imagine the credit asset has no systematic risk or to use the Basil's notion, let's assume it has no systematic exposure to the general economy because this is a proxy for exposure to the general economy. In that case, this part right here, because this is zero, drops out. This is one, and we're left with the, just this part right here, which would be the standard normal cumulative distribution of the inverse standard normal cumulative distribution of the probability of default. And these cancel each other out, and we would be left with the probability of default. And so if the systematic risk were zero, if the correlation were zero, we would have here loss given default times probability default minus the same thing. In other words, the red line would be exactly on the green line. So I explain it this way so that we can imagine now increasing the systematic risk of the credit asset from zero to something higher. And let's note it will have to be higher than zero because the rules dictate that the correlation needs to be at least 12%. And so as we increase the correlation, we're increasing the systematic risk and the red line moves to the right. And it moves to the right as a function of this correlation. Higher correlation means greater systematic risk or exposure of the credit asset to the general economy. And it's in that way that this function is essentially weighting, on the one hand, the probability of default for the exposure and this hardwired 99.9%. The higher the correlation, the more this line is going to move to the right. But after this formula is done translating the PD, because here's the probability of default, if we take an, an inverse normal and then a normal, we'll end up here with a conditional expected loss, which is the credit VAR, and we'll subtract the expected loss. And that'll give us the unexpected loss. And then there is also a, if I go over to the right, a maturity adjustment. So the maturity of the exposure matters. The longer the maturity, the greater the risk, and the more the capital charge. Okay, so finally, just briefly, here's the spreadsheet uploaded to the member page. If you'd like to take a look at the formula in action, and you can see in yellow, it takes the probability of default as an input, it takes the loss given default as an input, the exposure at default as an input, and the maturity. So those are the four inputs. It calculates expected loss, which we know is probability of default times loss given default. We can also multiply the exposure in there to get the expected loss in dollar terms. Here's that asset correlation, which need to be at least 12% under Basel II. That's the row of 18%. A scaling factor because the uh, Basel scales up the uh, capital at the end of the day to make an overall adjustment. More on that later. Here's the hardwired confidence of 99.9%. Here's the maturity adjustment. That reflects that final term in the IRB function that I just showed you. And here's the unexpected loss calculation. So right here in this formula, so it, it's a quite a bit of detail, but it's just the implementation, if I move this up here, of this formula here that I just reviewed. You can find that right in this cell C17. And then a total capital requirement that adds the unexpected loss to the expected loss. So that's a general overview of the IRB risk weight function. This is David Harper, the Bonnock Turtle. Thanks for your time.